it's relatively quickly you guys came together to make that happen, huh? So um, what a what a treat. Uh, we do invite you guys to be creative and do that from time to time. Every t every time would be great. We love it. Thank you. Um, now we just need a men's group. You know, we can't can't leave it just to the ladies. We gotta have some balance here. You know what? It, what an absolute uh, blessing. I know God is honored and. And we are, are very blessed to be able to participate in, in uh, listening to that beautiful music. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have, we have been blessed by your presence already. We've been blessed through music. We've been blessed through uh, stories and through prayer and Bible study. Father, we just continue in that same spirit right now. We seek a blessing as we contemplate uh, a message today, Father. I pray that you would speak and that this would be a, a holy place uh, because of your presence. And we, we pray this and we believe this by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to also give a, a special thank you to, to Jeff and George and the team for uh, helping us with AV. You can see there are a lot of moving pieces to all of the video and the mics and getting everything going. And uh, I just appreciate uh, their contribution and trying to keep everything flowing. You guys have done a great job today uh, up till now. We'll see. Um, I've been looking forward to talking with you today on this special weekend and I've entitled the, the sermon, The Hope. And uh, for the kids quiz, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I want to give you young people, and I, I need the help from older folks here today. Be quiet. <laughs> I want to see if the kids recognize some old-fashioned words and know what they are. And there's going to be a temptation to see it and want to shout it out. All right? But um, I'm going to ask for those 16 and under. All right? If you're 17, you know, you've got a driver's license, whatever. You're old, Okay. 16 and under is what I'm looking for here. I want to see if you recognize some old-fashioned words. Okay? You ever heard of a Davenport before? What, what is a Davenport? And these are, the, the, the right answer is up there. Is it the old term for a phone jack? You know, you got to plug it into the port, the Davenport. An inland sea harbor. Okay, it's not on the sea. It's an inland sea. A type of furniture or a prayer of blessing. Okay, Jacob. Now, how did you know that? Do your mom and dad still use the word Davenport? <laughs> Does grandma and grandpa still use Davenport? All right, you're just a smart boy. That's right. So, yeah, it's it's Davenport is what my grandparents called the couch, right? That's the couch. It's actually, and I just learned this, it was actually a furniture company, the Davenport Furniture Company in Massachusetts. And, and Davenport just became the kind of catch-all term for any piece of furniture, kind of like how we use the word Coke. Someone say, hey, you want a Coke? Oh, yeah, sure. What do you got? Well, I got Pepsi. I got 7-Up, right? But the, well, you kind of call a soda a Coke. So that's kind of how Davenport came to be known uh, for uh, really any type of furniture, but per particularly a couch or a piece of furniture that could be made into a bed is a Davenport. Okay, I didn't fool you on that one. How about this one? Drain board. Is this a boring person? Oh, stop being such a drain board, Jeff. Is it a plumber's tool? Hey, son, would you hand me the drain board so I can take care of this? Is it the ship's lowest deck? Oh, I better go down to the drain board to make sure I got everything in order. Is it, Or is it the kitchen countertop? Don't set it on the drain board. All right, yeah. The ship's lowest deck. It kind of sounds like a drain, you know, the board and the drain, but it's not. It's not. Okay, Toby. <laughs> it's not a plumber's tool. <laughs> Sebastian. A kitchen countertop. How many of you grew up calling the kitchen counter the drain board? Nobody grew up calling the kitchen counter the drain board? Or you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> so, yeah, literally that's what it used to be called because it would be tilted and it would drain. It would, you know, when you were uh, got, did your dishes or whatever, it would drain right into the sink. Number three, carpet sweeper. Carpet sweeper. You know, I was in my 20s before I first heard this word. Is it a broom made from used carpet, an electric vacuum, a schoolyard game? Hey, guys, let's play carpet sweeper. 
Or is it an old term for a golf club? Hey, would you hand me the carpet sweeper so I can? What, what's a carpet sweeper? Anna? C? D, an old, a term for a golf club? Well, maybe if you're Alex Smith, but not me. No. Was that what you were going to say, Ketsia? All right, did you want to guess? Which one is it? An electric vacuum. You are right. How many of you called the vacuum the carpet sweeper? Some of you? Okay, a few brave souls are really to admit that I break the carpet sweeper out. It's, it's kind of a funny term. You can see the transition from when you would sweep to the vacuum, and they called it a carpet sweeper. All right, next one. Sarsaparilla. An orange tabby cat. Uh, a fit of madness like exasperation. Oh, I had a, a, a bout of sarsaparilla just recently. A soft drink similar to root beer. Or a near-extinct disease kind of like polio. I came down with the sarsaparilla again. Leah, have you had it before? No, you've never had it before? She is right, though. It's a soft drink similar to root beer. How many of you have, how many of you have had sarsaparilla? Most of you have not. Maybe you're not into the soda drinking uh, scene. Um, I recently read this is still pretty popular in Mexico, that actually the sarsaparilla plant that is made from most of it comes from Mexico, and so sarsaparilla is still pretty popular. We used to go to a restaurant going up. It was a kind of an old settler-style restaurant. They still serve sarsaparilla. All right, I don't remember how many more I have. Jalopy. Jalopy. An old rundown car, look at that old jalopy. An early computing machine, I'm working on the jalopy. A pair of old shoes, a small kitchen appliance. Yeah, right here, right here. What would you say? Yeah, you. You think it's an old rundown car? Do you guys have a jalopy at home? No. <laughs> He's right. It's a People used to call an old rundown car. They call it jalopy. Um, kind of sounds like a brand of jello to me, but jalopy. All right. See all the things we're learning today? Hi fi. Remember the hi fi? Is hi fi what, what precursor means it came before? Did it come before Wi fi? Like before we upgraded to Wi fi, we had hi fi. Did it come just before radio and home audio systems? Is that what there was before VCR tapes? You can see they're all technology. Or is it a precursor to social media? All right, Mr. Baptized, member of the church, Caleb, what do you have to say? You think it's a precursor to Wi-Fi? No, we didn't cover that in our lessons, did we? Sorry. It's not a precursor to Wi-Fi. Okay, yeah, right here. Yeah, you in the green. You are right. Why, uh, Hi-Fi uh, stands for high fidelity. Uh, was an early attempt to make a concert sound like a concert at home. That's really what it was. That's why it's called high fidelity. It was it was an attempt to make a real big band sound uh, come at home, and then uh, eventually a uh, 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 much low powered, lower quality radio came out. <laughs> Um, I have a funny story, though, about Wi-Fi. How many of you remember the very first time you saw at a restaurant or something, it posted free Wi-Fi? Do any of you remember that? Did you know what it was when you saw that for the first time? So we have some very close friends. They're actually like family. We call them aunts and uncles. Um, Aunt Shawanda is her name. Uh, she lived in western Washington. And she told me that the first time she saw uh, at like a Starbucks or something, free Wi-Fi. In her mind, you know, the movie Free Willy had not been out that much longer. And, you know, wa living up in Washington State, you know, and, and having the orcas in the boat, she thought it was like free Wi-Fi. And it was like a protest about, you know, they're they're keeping Wi-Fi in, in some aquarium. We need to free Wi-Fi. Whoever Wi-Fi is free Wi-Fi, like free, free Willy. Then she learned <laughs> it just means... <laughs> wireless internet, wireless fiber. So uh, I, I think that's hilarious. And it just goes with Shawanda's personality. It's just hilarious. I, I love it so much. Free Wi-Fi. 
old-fashioned words, old-fashioned things. You know, some people think the church is a little old-fashioned. Kind of, you know, it was good for the grandparents, and I'm glad that generation enjoyed it, but it's really gotten a little old-fashioned, a little rundown. It's kind of quaint. That's a church in Idaho, by the way. It's quaint. It's, uh, you know, it, it's for country folk and, and those that, uh, you know, don't have an urban lifestyle. It's for hicks without TV, right? The church is, if not abandoned, nearly or needing to be abandoned. It's old-fashioned. That's really not an uncommon, we may not always put it in those terms, we may not say it in that exact way, but in, to a degree, much of our society, and even those in the church, often live that way. It's just not really that important. It, it was for another generation in another time in another context, but it's gotten a little old-fashioned. And in all fairness, at times, we in the church have been slow to adapt. I mean, I think we still have the 8-track machine, don't we? Right? There, you know, churches that still have the audio cassette ministry, right? Uh, they've not really gotten up with the time. So there's a, a level of fairness where the church has struggled at times to continue to be relevant. But as a concept, as a understanding of what the church is, many people think of it as old-fashioned, as fading away. And I think that that stands in stark contrast to what the Lord told Peter when Peter confessed the identity of Christ in Matthew chapter 16. And this is going to be one of a couple very important verses for us this morning, and I want to zero in on a couple elements of this. Jesus, and I've, I've compressed uh, several verses and just uh, put in the, the poignant pieces here. Jesus looks at his apostle and he says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Okay? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And then he, a few verses later he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, will not overpower it. Now, I don't know about you, but when Jesus says things like this that are so definitive, so declarative, this is not a parable, uh, this is not a, uh, uh, you know, an estimate or a metaphor, Jesus is speaking in very clear tones. This is my church. It's my church. I will. Be, it's not your church. It's my church. I will build my church, and there is nothing the devil can do that will overpower it. The gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overpower it. That does not sound like a concept that is meant to ever be old-fashioned or ever fade away or ever lack relevance. From the lips of the Savior, from the lips of Jesus, he declares in this statement, my church is an eternal church. It's of eternal importance. It is to stand forever. I will build it and it will last and there will be no power that shall overcome it. No power will be able to stand against it. And, the, and, the, and hell will not be able to prevent the church from breaking down those gates and going in and rescuing people out of it. Right? It does not sound like God ever intended. Yes, we need to adapt. Yes, we need to change. Yes, we need to grow and, and, and embrace the best ways of reaching our community and, and discipling and being evangelists. All those things are true. But the church is not to be forgotten or neglected by, from what I understand Jesus saying here. Now, I want you to notice something that often we just pass over. We, we, we focus on a couple of different aspects on this for, for several theological reasons. I want you to notice what he calls him here, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah. Now, Bar is simply the Aramaic way of saying son of. All right, in Hebrew it would be Ben, like Ben-Hur. Toby and I just watched Ben-Hur together for the first time. Ben, uh, in Hebrew, like Benjamin, son of my right arm. Ben-Hur, son of her. Okay, in Aramaic it's Bar, like Bartholomew or Barabbas or Barsabbas. 
okay, or Bar Jonah. It just means son of, all right? Okay, and Jonah is the name Jonah. So it's Simon, son of Jonah, is how the Lord addresses him here. And then he later on he says, uh, and you are Peter. Remember, he named him Peter. Jesus named Simon, the apostle Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, I, I want to get a couple of things just kind of out of the way because this verse is so uh, singular in certain aspects as far as what the meaning of the church is. Jesus is not saying that Peter is the foundation of the church, but he's also, he also is saying that Peter is foundational to the church, okay? Jesus, Peter is not the foundation, but he is foundational, okay? I hope that you will allow that. But I just want to uh, express that the Bible does not teach that Peter, not Christ, is the foundation of the church. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll spend time in Ephesians in a little bit too, but Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers, aliens, but you are fellow citizens, saints, and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles. Okay, this is Paul now saying, The apostles have given us a foundation, okay, and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay, so Jesus is the first and primary aspect of what the church is founded on. He goes on to say, in whom, okay, so in Christ, the whom is a reference to Christ. In Christ, the whole building being fitted together is going into a temple in the Lord. So Paul makes no uh, 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 bones about it. The church is founded on Christ. The whole building is fitted together in Christ. But the apostles and prophets do have a role in in establishing the identity and priority of the church. He goes on to say, in whom, also representing Christ, in Christ you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Okay? So Paul makes it very clear that, yes, Christ is the chief cornerstone, and the whole building comes together in Christ. So uh, with all due respect to our Catholic brethren who, who really want to make Peter the foundation and set Christ off to the side, we would differ with that respectfully and say that isn't consistent with Scripture. Yes, the, the church is founded, and, and the apostles and prophets are foundational, but Christ is the chief cornerstone. And this gave me a reminder elsewhere in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, be imitators of me. Okay? So we need to follow Paul. He says that, be imitators of me. But then he goes, just as I also am of Christ. Okay, do you understand the parallel here? Paul says, look, you need to imitate me insofar as I'm imitating Christ. Because if I'm imitating Christ, when you follow me, you're following Christ. And if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. It's the same idea with Peter being part of the foundation of the church. He is, so far as he is on Christ, we can build on top of him. Okay? So I do disagree with some of our commentators that try to remove Peter completely out of the, the story altogether. Christ very clearly says in you, I'm going to build my church. I'm just trying to indicate that the scriptures do not mean that that. Peter is the only foundation here to make it even. And this was the great passage that Luther quoted to, uh, um, oh, what was it, Eck? In, in the debate with Eck? How do you forget a name like that, Eck? <laughs> kind of like, yuck, Eck. <laughs> First Corinthians 3.21, Luther, when, when uh, they were trying to argue that Peter was the foundation of, of the church, Luther quotes this, and he says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay, so Christ is the foundation of the church, but as part of that foundation, he has given us the example of the apostles and the prophets. He's given us, uh, he's given us uh, Paul and, and the other letters uh, that we can place our trust in. So I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way, and we can talk more about that later if you want to, because again, this, this verse in, in Matthew is, is pretty uh, significant in many circles. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but in some ways, I want to uh, just give you what the Bible very basically and simply defines the church as. And, and we obviously could spend a lot of time on this. The word church in Greek is simply ecclesia. Okay? Uh, we get our English word church from the German. That's kirche. Okay? In German, kirche is church. In Dutch, it's kerk. All right? And as uh, English is a, 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 a German language, it's a, a, a Germanic language. So uh, the English pronunciation church comes from... Uh, more closely the Dutch, actually, but going back to the German Kirka. But in Greek, it's Ecclesia. You guys keep in notes. This is powerful stuff. This is great stuff. All right, Ecclesia. Two basic meanings, though, of Ecclesia. 
And by the way, ecclesia was a common Greek word. It wasn't like it was only used among the apostles and people. It was a, it was a word used for a lot of things, but it means called out. Ecclesia, actually, kalo, from where ecclesia comes from, is the word call, and ek means out. Called out, all right? And, and here in Romans, he even shortens it to the called. You are the called of Jesus Christ. So the church in the Bible, okay, in the New Testament, was those called out. Now, called out means different things. It does mean called out of Babylon. It does mean called out of sin and selfishness. It does mean being called out of slavery, all right, and finding freedom. It does mean those things. But more primarily, ecclesia and the church and being called out meant being called out for action, called out for service. Think of it in almost a, a kind of a military thing. I've been called up. I've been called out. If you're in the military and you hear that, that doesn't mean, oh, you mean you've been, uh, you know, uh, called out of the barracks, you know, and you're just going to sit now over here. No, it means I'm going into action. I've been called to action. That's the more primary meaning of the church. A group of people called out of their circumstances to serve the Lord. All right? Is that okay? All right? The second word that is largely associated with the word church and ecclesia is assembly. Those who have been called out to assemble, and here in Hebrews, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. It was those who gather together. If And almost the idea, if we're not together, if we're not gathered, we're not a church. And I'm not trying to say that our, our people watching from home or virtual does not mean, I mean, we can be together in different ways, but it means we have a common goal and interest that we are called out to and gathered for. And again, uh, when you think of an, an, an assembly, um, it, it's people who are assembled for a reason because they've been given a mission. They've been given a mission. Okay, all of that was lead up and introduction to come back to this passage here in Matthew and come back to this interesting thing of Jesus calling Simon Barjona. Why did Jesus call him that? Now, in John, Jesus, when he speaks to Peter, he calls him Simon, son of John. And many Bible commentators and scholars will say, really, they're the same name. John, Jonah, they're really, you know, it's just over time, John and Jonah. And, and forgive me for this, I think that's silly. I think that's, ap John and Jonah, even in Hebrew, are different names. They're spelled different. They're pronounced different. They have different meanings. Did, did Matthew know who Jonah was? Did, did the Hebrews know who Jonah was? Of course they knew. Do you think they got Jonah's name somehow mixed up? Uh, in, in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, John's name is Yohanan. Yohanan. And there's about 10 or 12 Yohanans in the Old Testament. It was spelled different, pronounced different. There's really no way Matthew could have gotten confused. Now, Matthew was the better scholar in Greek. All right. He was much more educated. His Greek is much more precise. John was a juvenile. He did juvenile. It sounded like a juvenile offender. No, a juvenile. All right. He did not have the education. So his his Greek is a little bit more um, simplistic, but they knew these names. I, I want to say to you that this is not an accident that Jesus called him son of Jonah. Now, in our Greek Western mindset, when we hear the name son, uh, the Greek idea of being a son was a derivative. I have derived from the father. It was very literal. I am my father's son. I'm not my grandfather's son. I'm my grandfather's grandson. I am my father's son. I only have one father, and I am his son. It's derivative. I derive from my father. Okay, That's mostly the Greek, Western, Occidental. Most of us, when we hear son, that's what we think of. We, we come from that worldview and culture. It was not that way in the Hebrew culture or the Eastern Oriental culture. Son of meant in the likeness of. This is why Jesus was the son of David. He did not derive immediately. Yes, he is of the lineage. Okay, I understand that. But he was the son of David because, because he came in the likeness of David. He was the son of Abraham because he came in the likeness of Abraham. This is why Paul could call Timothy his son. You are my son, Timothy. He, re, he says that about a dozen times in the New Testament. I'm sending to you my son, Timothy. It doesn't mean that Timothy derived literally biologically from Paul. It means he's coming in my image, in my likeness. In my character. Are you with me? Okay. So the question is, which one is it here with Bar-Jonah? Is, is Jesus identifying Simon 
as the son of the of the literal son of his father named Jonah? Or is he identifying him because of his faith in Christ, because of the establishment that Christ is planning to place the church on the foundation of the apostles? Okay? And so he's identifying, you are now coming in the likeness of the prophet Jonah. I want to argue before you this morning that he is calling him a son of Jonah because he is identifying him with the prophet Jonah. By the way, Jonah means dove. John means God is gracious. I mean, they're totally different names. Just because in English, Jonah, John, they kind of sound alike. It's simply uh, silly to suggest that they're, they're misunderstood and got the same. I'm suggesting to you that Peter, in addition to being the rock, in addition to being the rock, Jesus was identifying him as someone to come in the name and image of Jonah. He even mentions Jonah just a few verses before. I didn't put it on the screen. But in, uh, in Matthew 16, he even mentions the sign of Jonah. Um, in verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. A sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And then just a few minutes later, he says, you are Simon bar Jonah. Isn't that interesting? Now, what would it be about Jonah that would make it interesting or significant that in the context of the foundation of the church, Jesus would identify Peter as being a son of Jonah. I want to just very quickly and, and uh, recount and recall the story of Jonah with you. Remember, Jonah is called out of Israel, right? And many times when you hear or you think of the story of Jonah, as a matter of fact, I studied the book of Jonah in, in college. We spent time as a class looking at it. And the predominant thinking and, and attitude of, of many when it comes to the idea of the story of Jonah. I'm not saying this is yours or it has to be, but a lot of people, when they think of the story of Jonah, they see a God, a very demanding God, who comes to a reluctant prophet and demands that he does something that seems like the impossible. You're going to go to the wicked city of Nineveh and you're going to preach. And he's very demanding and he's He's austere in that demand. And the very reasonable thing for Jonah to do then is flee. I mean, that's very natural. That's very normal. That's very human. We, we sympathize with Jonah's desire to flee. All right? And then in his wrath and anger, God, because of the disobedience of Jonah, threatens to destroy not only his life, but the life of the innocent sailors that he happened to be uh, sailing with. So God sends this voracious storm to swallow him up and destroy him, right? And, and this wrathful, vengeful God, angry with the prodigal prophet. Okay, this is sometimes how we think of the book of Jonah and, and the heavy handedness of God. I mean, why, why, am I not allowed to tell God no? What kind of God is that? I mean, it may be the wrong choice, but I should have the right to tell God no if I want to tell him no. But God wouldn't allow Jonah to say no. In his arrogance and in his wrath and anger, God pursues Jonah because Jonah's not doing what he asked him to do. Many people think of the story like this, right? And this, here, I, I like this picture of the storm, the big jaws of the waves coming to get him, right? Okay, so then the, the, the sailors act in more righteousness even than Jonah. They cast him into the sea. And then to further humiliate and humble this very reasonable prophet, God does this crazy additional thing about having him swallowed by this sea creature of some kind, probably a whale. Um, it's the only biological creature I think that makes sense, but who knows what it was. Um, and to further humiliate and humble and force Jonah to do what he doesn't want to do, he swallows him up. And for three days, Jonah lives in the stink and the weeds and the, the smells of this animal until he finally comes to his senses and says, okay, God, I guess I'll do it. And then in, in probably the last aspect of humiliation, you know, the Jews, um, for all the blood and stuff and sacrifices in Judaism, they're very clean, almost a germaphobic people. Uh, really, as a culture, Jews are very clean. So to use the word vomit uh, is just another indicator of, of, you know, God humbling this, this, uh, this very, you know, reasonable prophet. And so the fish vomits up. Jonah onto dry land. Okay. Any of you resonate at all with kind of that thinking when it comes to the story of Jonah? Now, because I've been so strong and embellishing it that way, you probably don't want to raise your head. 
Uh, but that's often the way it sounds when people think of it, uh, of the story of Jonah. I don't think that's the way the Lord looks at it, and I don't think that's what it meant when God identified Peter as needing to be a son of Jonah. I want you to think of it in a different context with the establishment of his church. When, when Nineveh, uh, which had, by the way, just been through a series of plagues, okay? Nineveh was ripe for redemption. God knew that. And God wanted an opportunity for an entire, really, civilization. I mean, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It was the head. It was the most prominent uh, city within an entire empire. When God knew that the time was ripe for that, he needed someone to be the catalyst to bring salvation to that city. He was looking for someone to go out and be his prophet, be his spokesperson. So when he comes to Jonah, he is not a demanding, austere, uh, uh, you know, uh, God just saying, I, whether you like it or not, go. He's coming as a savior. He's coming and saying, Jonah, the opportunity for salvation has come for Nineveh. I need you to get up and go. And you, you might say, well, why? if Jonah said no, why, did, why didn't God choose someone else? God knew it had to be Jonah. It had to be Jonah. No one could do it. It had to be Jonah. Okay? And when Jonah ran and God sends the storm, this is not a wrathful, angry God. This is a desperate Savior. This is a father knowing that he has 120,000 people who are on the edge of either eternal life or eternal damnation. And this is a cry from a God desperate to bring salvation to people. This is, this is a, a God laying down his life in front, of, uh, in, in front of Jonah and saying, you must, you must, if you don't, Jonah, if you don't, an entire city could be lost. This is the desperate cry of a savior, of a father, not of a wrathful, vengeful God, but of a savior coming to his, to his church and saying, I have called you out to bring salvation to the people. Please, do not give up. And when he sends the fish or the whale or the creature, it was not to humiliate and, and uh, uh, you know uh, bring harm to Jonah. It was his method of bringing Jonah to the opportunity for seeing the goodness and greatness of God. It's funny, when you read the prayer of Jonah in Jonah chapter 2, he's repenting in that. He never even says, can I get out of the fish, by the way, please? Thank you. He's accepting that God will not let him go until he fulfills this duty. So Jonah comes, even in uh, struggling in his own understanding, we know that he uh, uh, still uh, thinks the city is going to be destroyed. And these are the last two verses of the book of Jonah. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, and which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand? It means they're an open book. And then he even mentions the animals. I love this. He even says, should I not have compassion? If, if they're not saved, even the animals would perish, and I don't want that. I, I love that God even says, uh, the animals are part of my plan. The whole point of the story of Jonah is God calling a prophet, calling his church to bring salvation to people ready to be saved and to display the compassion of God. It is my conviction and belief that when God called Peter, when Jesus called Peter a son of Jonah, he was saying, you as the foundational apostle on the foundation of Christ, your character and your personality is in line with the mission and the personality of Jonah. Your church is to be a church filled with people willing to listen to the heart of God and the plan of God and to go out and bring salvation to people. That is what the church is about. That's what we're about. 
And that will never be old-fashioned. That will never fade away. That will never be irrelevant. God will always look for a people willing to heed His call to bring His gospel and His compassion to people who are desperate to hear it. Aren't we all sons of Jonah? That wasn't meant to be rhetorical. Aren't we all sons of Jonah? That is what God calls all of us to do. Now, I want you to see um, when, when Paul is talking about the church being founded on the apostles and Christ being the cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2, um, he goes on to say this in Ephesians chapter 3. Okay, listen to what Paul says. He's just said, in whom the whole building being fitted together is going into a temple of the Lord, in whom you're all being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. The very next thing he says is this in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, now listen to this. He says, God's grace, which was given to me for you. Did, did, did you catch it? Did you? Maybe I'll do it again, Vince. Some over here are kind of slow. I know we've got the, the advanced team over here, but I'm going to say it again. Notice what Paul says. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus for your sake, you Gentiles. For if indeed you've heard the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. Question. Why has God given you grace? Because I need it. I want it. I want it. I need it. Yes, that's all true. But if you take the grace of God, His salvation, His promise, and you only apply it to yourself, you only say, thank you, God, for forgiving me for all my sins. I am righteous in your sight. I am holy and redeemed. It's all for me, and I'm just going to live in that forever. And you do nothing to share it? I think you may have missed it. Later on, notice this. Later on, in verse uh, 8, Ephesians chapter 3. To me, Paul says, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the unfathomable riches of Christ. I hope I'm not being too uh, uh, vague in this. God selected Peter to be an example element in the church of someone called out in similar ways Jonah was called out to preach and bring salvation to people. And Paul here in Ephesians says the whole purpose of the church, the whole purpose of his grace in my life and in yours is for you to give it to others. That's why we exist. To me, the very uh, the least of the saints is grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light that which is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers, the authorities in the heavenly places. It is in the church that the manifold wisdom of God is made manifest. That is the only place on earth that His wisdom is made manifest. It's not on television. It's not on social media. It's not anywhere else but in His church. The called out, the assembly. And if ever there was a time that the church needed to represent the manifold wisdom of God it's today this was in accordance with the eternal purpose the eternal purpose not old fashioned the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him we are all sons we are all 
called to reach people for salvation. We have different talents. We have different gifts. We are all different parts of the body. Some of us are hands. Some of us are feet. Some of us are ears. Some of us are eyes. Some of us are the guts, right? Some of us are the legs. We all have different roles, but when we come together as his body, that is what we exist for. And it's for that and nothing else that this church should be about. If not us, who will go to Nineveh? The church is the hope of the world. You, you, you are the hope of the world. Our eternal hope is in Christ. Our foundation is Christ. But built upon that foundation is you. And no one else. You. I hope that you will spend time with the Lord today, this week, and on a regular basis asking God, what are you calling me to do in your church? If you're visiting, I hope you have a church that's your church you can find your way to be involved in your church. But God has called you. We are all sons of Jonah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is such a joy and privilege to be able to speak and to be in front of your people here, Lord. But I pray that it would not be my words or any of my anecdotes or anything that would be significant here, Father. I pray that your spirit would be speaking to every heart that every person in the sound, within the sound of my voice would be hearing your voice, Lord. It's not my place to dictate to anyone that they need to do X, Y, or Z. It's really just to bring people to the point where they come to you, Lord, and allow your spirit, whether through lightning bolts or whispers or visions or dreams, to draw your people together, to call us out, to call us to assemble, and to call us to be a people ready to do your will. So Father, thank you for being our Adonai. Thank you for saving and bringing young people to the decision to be baptized. And Lord, thank you that we can be part of this church, the global church and this local church. Make us the people you want us to be. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you're planning on eating, we'll be over there in just a few moments in our fellowship hall. And then at 2 o'clock, our visioning weekend continues. God bless.